part one on one with Mr. Burger. <laughs> Welcome to another episode of Art One-on-One. I'm your pod boss, Nicole Jordan, alongside your professional artist and master educator, Mr. Berger. Welcome back. Thanks for yeah. for joining me, as always, oh pod boss. Do I have a choice? Uh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> I mean, you do, and you, I, you know, I need you. Yeah. This just wouldn't be the same and work without your guidance and... No one else would listen to you? No one else would listen to me. <laughs> Just kidding. Boy, have I tried to find others, but there's no one like you. Uh, of course. There is no one like me. I am a little... You're a little... You're a little different. Which is why it works. There you go. So, what is on, uh, what's on the agenda today? Well, I think we can start by our normal... Um, I was going to say episode, our normal segment of Ask the Art Guides. Oh. Why are you doing this to me? Like the, the segment. <laughs> okay. That's, that's the... <laughs> I thought that was you telling me to get my thing. No. I, I wasn't in... Maybe it was subliminal. So what, what is the... What do the Art Oracle folks have in store for us as we consult the Art Guides? It is uh, Henry Matisse. Oh, Henri Matisse. Henri Matisse. Not Henri. 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 Okay, what is the correct? Henri Matisse. All right, well, I'm just not going to say his name. I'll Uh, say Matisse. Yeah, most people say Henry. We're Americans. But without question, somebody's going to get out (laughs) of the comments and be like, You stupid. You stupid head. You don't know nothing. Uh, okay, so we have the life, the work, and the inspiration. Which way are we going? I liked his work. The one on his work. Uh, okay. I think he was Pro- ahead of his time on this one. It, and that could be. Uh, productivity, even in pajamas. I mean, that's today's world. That's t- that's very post, <laughs> post-COVID uh, uh, mentality. I mean, business on top. Pajamas on the bottom. Right. I do it all the time. And it's like, you know, you, you, you get on your Zoom meeting and you do your thing. And that's very much. The, but Matisse was always like, uh, he had a lot of health problems at the end of his life. Well, okay. Yeah. And uh, and so he would do lots of things at home. He didn't really go out. He wasn't very mobile. He, he had uh, mobility issues. And uh, uh, for a, the end of his life, he was wheelchair and bedridden. Uh, wheelchair bound and bedridden, and so uh, just you know, he would be in his bed, and uh, you know, somebody would bring him his supplies and his art materials, and uh, right there at bedside, he would just go to work. It didn't really matter that he, um, his disabilities would not hold him back from productivity. So, um, but Matisse, the liberator of color. He, yeah, uh, I like him. Yeah, he he's he's very um, you know, he he kind of said, you know, the colors of things don't matter. The, you know, a face doesn't have to be flesh colored. A face could be literally blue or green or purple or like, well, how can you use that and that and it, he would make it work. He proved that uh colors uh, don't need to be confined to certain things, even more so. He took the ideas of the Impressionists and really smashed the door down even further in terms of color and and approach and, and abstraction. And he was kind of a rival of Picasso. And uh, he took some of Picasso's ideas and said, yeah, brown, let's make it hot pink. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, lots of good stuff from... From Matisse. He's very different. I mean, I always say, I feel like the artists, a lot of the artists you study are very, like their art is very dark and dreary and he yeah, is definitely he's not. not. And he's not. I loved. He's a very positive, upbeat guy and and did lots of really interesting projects throughout his life. So his movement into color, not really, or really like expanding on color, mm. is that the Fauvist? That they talk about the Fauvist movement, or what is that? Fauvist. 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 
Falvest, Favest, um, which is basically, uh, in translation, means wild beasts. The wild beasts. Because he would paint, um, he, he would just use colors like a madman. Yeah. You know? And so th his group became known as the Favists. And uh, what was your question? <laughs> was that transition into using all that color, was that the Favist? Group? Yeah, yeah, for sure. And that's, that, that's a component of it. And a lot of people that, that uh, were working in that Favist way uh, very much were liberal with their color use. You know, they weren't confined to color and they were fo very much following Matisse's lead in that regard. He was... And this is post-Impressionism. Correct. This, well, be careful how you say that because there's the Impressionists and then there's the post-Impressionists. He is not a post-Impressionist. He is a Falvist, which is after Impressionism, after post-Impressionism. That's what I just said. But you said post-Impressionist. So it came after. Correct. It came after the Impressionists and the post-Impressionists. Happened at the same time. No, he's after the post-Impressionists. Which is what I said, so why are you trying to... Because saying post-Impressionist, post-Impressionist is its own art movement. I got that. And he's but it after came that. after Impressionists. The post-impressionist. The post-impressionists are post-impressionist, but he's post post-impressionist. Oh my gosh. Okay, I don't know how that's any different when I said there is impressionist, because, because, post-impressionist, then father. Because uh, if I say yes, he's post-impressionist, somebody's going to say he is not a post-impressionist. He is not a post-impressionist, and he's not a post-impressionist. He's a fathist. Which is which? Which is a movement that came after post-impressionism. I just want it to be clear because you know sometimes I get you know you read the comments, you get little people send you little messages and this and that, and they say, oh, "Mr. Berger, for an educated person, you sure are a moron." You are being, being very nitpicky today. Well. Moving on from that. And speaking of the oh, Impressionists. Speaking of Impressionists. That's what your video was on this last week. The Oh, yeah, yeah. The for sure. 7th? The 7th Impressionist, Impressionist Art Exhibition. Yes. And I believe it was... Oh, boy. You'll have to go back into the archives of the, uh, the pod. But at one point in the pod, you had asked me, what is the best... Yes, it wasn't that many episodes ago. It was like two or three. I can't recall. But I do know it happened. And <laughs> when it happened, you asked me, what was the greatest um, uh, show of the Impressionists? And it was this one. And it's number seven. The seventh Impressionist show is the greatest one they ever had. It's the, it's the most successful across the board. Was it the same length of time as the prior ones or because it was more successful it spread out a little bit longer? Uh it, it did not it was still a month long. Okay. It came it went over um it went a, a, a duration over a couple of it spread over a couple of months, but it was still a month long. A typical. Yeah. Okay. It, it, basically that question came to my mind. Basically was it was it was the same length of time basically but um the time frame was a little bit altered but the model of it came from henry uh from paul durant rule who was a uh yeah i've had henry matisse in my head and it yes. just popped out but no um paul durant rule or ruel and he was a a gallery owner and he would show art and he the year prior uh, he, uh, it was 1881. He had a really great showing and, um, of the, uh, of the impressionists. He took works and things like that and put on a show, which was more impressionistic than the impressionist exhibition was right. that year, uh, because of the, the leading, independent. right, which was number six. Yes. And that was led by. Um, if you'll recall, Edgar Degas, who was kind of a saboteur of the Impressionists, whether he wouldn't have, I don't think he did it intentionally, right. but he, but he was. Well, it was probably one of those things where you like, you know, you only see things through your lens yeah. and he was seeing things a certain way. And that's just what, and, and he thought in this particular year, 
the Impressionists said, we're not going to put you in charge, Degas. And, yes. and, so, and, they, and they said, we're not going to let you l- bring all of your, your uh, realist buddies in and ruin it. And he said, in protest, if you're not going to let my protege in, if you're not going to let my people in, well, then screw you. I'm leaving. Right. And he and so he left, and then a couple of other artists left, including Mary Cassatt, which was kind of a little bit of a blow because she was, I mean, Mary Cassatt, she was fantastic, yeah. but uh, losing her was a little bit of a a little bit of a nudge back. But what they gained from Monet and Renoir and all of the and Sicily and these real impressionist impressionists coming back, you know, who cares? Right. You know, at the end of the day, they couldn't really um, get too upset about losing a person that ended up coming fairly late to the game, as opposed to bringing back all of the heavy hitters that they started with. So, it's funny because we had this conversation. We we're kind of talking about the art exhibitions, just randomly, personally, oh. weeks ago. And remember, you said I asked you. I'm like, I want to know, like I. I don't want to watch ahead, but which one was the best one? And he told yeah. me this, and I, I, I said to you, it's because they they God was out of it, right? Yeah. So I knew and, it was coming, and that and that's it. And it was Dega and his approach and the way he did things really. It's kind of that. Even if you have a great team, if you have one player that's just a selfish hothead, it just affects everything else. It does. So okay, so what? What made this, other than pulling Degas out of there, what what was so successful about this exhibition? Well, it, it was a lot of the again. You brought in the gallery owner. You put the you put uh, a lot of the the important impressionists back in there, along with um, uh, Calabut and uh, Gustav Calabut was allowed to come in, even though he wasn't one of the originals, and. Um, you know, they uh, they just found a successful formula with that group. Well, and, mainly uh, because he had just had a, he'd just done that. Well, it, well, correct. Uh, Durant Rule had yes. just done the exhibition the year prior with uh, monetary and uh, success with the press and the and the people. You know, and so and that's and that's what it was. That's what it's all about, really. And uh, it'll, the, the conclusion that you'll get in December, the first week in December, it's going to be absolutely fantastic. I mean, you're, you're going you're gonna to be shocked what happens in the eighth one. And I don't know that there's ever anything with the art exhibitions or in general that shocks me. Why? I don't know. I don't know what can possibly happen that can shock me. It, well, it's the last happen. one. There is well, a... Well, which is interesting because this is like the pivotal or like the best one. So yeah. what, what the hell what the, went, went yeah. wrong that they, they have one more and they're done? They went from one to seven and seven was the best one they ever had. And that, so what happens... And, and again, you would never... You'd never see it coming. You never see it coming. I can't wait. Oh, <laughs> on pins and needles. Anyway, okay. I love that story. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think we should just hit Journey into the Archives. Journey into the Archives. This is our longest running segment. We need to come up with some different segments. I, I think we you are. Need, you need to brainstorm some ideas. We've got quite a few cards left, so that yeah, that will keep us going for a while. But yeah, we're. I think we're exhausting the journey into the archives although this I, one's I, interesting that i like the thing i'd like about journey in the archives that it, is that it kind of opens the door to old stuff that we've done to people that might not be as new or fresh or whatever to what what's going on so i like the journey into the archives i like to kind of talk about the videos that we've done i like the cards i'd like to just maybe sprinkle some i don't know we got to come up with something. And again, we're this. This is probably more of like a personal meeting yeah. sort of topic, as opposed to post podcast like, meeting. Yeah, yeah during it, the podcast right, right. Po- post post podcast, <laughs> not pre post. Oh, yeah, you whatever. agree with me on this one? Yeah. Okay. That's understandable. Thank God. But if there was a, a group called the post podcast, 
then you'd have to make it clear that no, this is not post podcast. It's post post podcast. But so, that pod, post podcast doesn't exist, so we'll go with it. So I went into the archives. <laughs> and what and, did you discover? Well, okay, so I was looking at the timing of things. Oh, right. And we're right around Veterans Day, right? Oh, yeah. But Veterans Day is right around the corner. Next, when uh, this posts? Uh, this weekend. Yes. And so I went into the video called The Soldier Who Saved Art History. Yes. Which and, you like. You and I, I like that video. It's not a long video. No, it's not. It's um, three and a half minutes. How long? Three and a half minutes Three, or three like minutes. That. And you did it about two years ago. And uh, that video I shot um, in Winterset, which is not very far. Um, we were and, just in Winterset. And Winterset is the home of the famous actor John Wayne. We have visited his museum. And we just went and visited... Clark Tower. I got to walk that, two miles. But the, to the, the tower. The, the tower has nothing to do with. What <laughs> well, it's winter set. I'm just saying we ventured that way quite a bit. But yes. Okay. John Wayne. And another native of winter set is uh, a, a gentleman by the name of George Stout, and George Stout is the. Uh, if you've seen the movie Monuments Men, and we watched the movie Monuments yes, Men, yeah. if you watch that, that, you'll notice that there's the George Clooney character who's called Frank Stokes. Now, the George Clooney character Frank Stokes is based on the real-life George Stout of Winterset, Iowa. And long story short, he was in the uh, military, got out of the military, in and out, he was... Uh, went to a, a local college here in Iowa called Grinnell, Grinnell College in Grinnell, Iowa. Left there, ended up at Harvard, studied art history at Harvard University, uh, Ivy League, big time thing. Ended up learning a lot about art history. Military service was in there, all of that sort of thing. World War II breaks out. And he's like, okay, these precious monuments are being destroyed. Artwork is being destroyed. Um, and not just the, the enemy was just, it wasn't Germans that were destroying this. This was Americans that were, hey, there's a bunch of Germans that ran into that building. Okay, blow it up. Well, well, I don't think they're going to be concerned about art when they're well, at war. But but that's the thing. That's why this group was put in place because they they wanted to try to preserve, like, oh, don't blow that up. Let's do it a different way. And they and it was actually successful. It wasn't a hundred percent successful, uh, but in this group they were able to not only discover stolen artworks from the Nazis that were uh, stolen from. Uh, Jewish families, artworks that were stolen out of museums, artworks that were stolen from churches, and and all and even more than that, but they were able to find it, retrieve it, and get it back to its rightful owner post-war. Now there are still litigations that are out there um, where artwork that was stolen by the Nazis was kind of funneled here, funneled there, underground, and there are families, predominantly Jewish families, who have a family history of owning these artworks that are trying to get their family's um, uh, works, of art, works of art back that were stolen uh, during war. Um, but that, be that as it may, or whatever, however you say it, regardless of those facts, um, George Stout was instrumental in going to, uh, throughout Europe, making sure, and Asia, uh, the movie, The Monuments Men doesn't go into his time in Asia, uh, in Japan, and making sure that artworks weren't destroyed in Japan as well. Um, but th this chronicles his time in, in Europe. But at any rate, he was able to say, listen, let's not do this, let's not do that, let's, you know, and he he had men that were in with George Patton and his 
his uh, group and he had people in the Battle of the Bulge and this and that and finding the artwork and discovering, you know, where they were hiding it. And um, a lot of these artworks were trying to be collected by Nazi leadership like Adolf Hitler, who wanted to build a art museum. His The first act as uh, the Fuhrer, the, the uh, Chancellor of Germany, he decides that he's going to build an art museum in Lenz, Austria, which is his hometown. And uh, he also builds one in Munich, uh, a big art museum. And he steals a bunch of artwork and he he's trying to build a collection to put in to these art museums. Um, he's stealing these during the war? Yes. Okay. As the war is going on, he's saying, there's this sculpture that I want. And it's in that church. He's kind of, he's kind of putting it in I place want, during e- Exactly. The uh, there's this piece in this church. It's there's great. this house with that piece. I want you to find uh, one of the big pieces that he, or the big artist that he loved was Vermeer. And he wanted to own all of the Vermeer paintings, which is possible because there are only, I want to say, there's less than 10. I, I want to say eight, but I know there's less than 10. Okay. That, that still exist for mere paintings. And so he was like, I want to own them all. So people were trying to get them. Uh, another one of the Nazi leadership um, was also trying to collect artwork. And so they were trying to under, they were basically trying to undercut each other to build their own collections of art as the war is going on. Um, and that was Goring. Goring was very much wanting to also collect artwork and things like that. And yeah, it's kind of wild, but, but true. So Stout was also during the war. It wasn't after the war. To Correct. Try to it was, it was uh, right after D-Day, which was uh, June the 6th, 1944. And I know you know that, but <laughs> June the 6th, 1944 was D-Day. And it was right after D-Day. They had, uh, the allies had control of, uh, basically that, that area of the beach of around, uh, Normandy in Northern France between, basically between France and, and Europe. Mm-hmm. And so they could boat over. And that's when the monuments men start doing what they're doing as, um, events start to unravel and they start to find out information like, uh, the Nero decree. The Nero decree was basically a, a document that was written by Adolf Hitler that basically said, if I get killed or if we start to fail, burn everything, destroy all the artwork, destroy everything. Don't, don't let them have anything back, destroy everything. And that would have, um, in the movie, they do a really good job of, of talking about the importance of art and the, the social impact of needing art and those sorts of things for history and for posterity and for uh, the understanding of certain things in our culture, uh, the cultural importance of art. And, um, and I think that's true of every culture, every society, which is why I think when you go into an art museum and you just see European paintings and drawings and things like that, like that's really great. But I love the fact that more of our modern museums whether you're talking about the Nelson Adkins, you're talking about uh, the Chicago Art Institute, you're talking about the um, you know the the little art centers in smaller towns or the bigger museums in New York or Los Angeles, they have an inclusion of Asian artifacts and um, the Mayans and the Incas and the uh, the Aborigines and the uh, not just white European fellas, but Women are represented, blacks are represented, Asians are represented, um, all walks of, of life and humanity that are creating things. Lots of people's voices are now being represented. And I think that, you know, as a white guy, I, you know, I want my voice represented, but I also want your voice represented. I want your story represented. I want you to be able to walk into a museum and say, yeah, I get that. I identify with that because quite frankly, you might not I don't know, you might not identify with the story that I'm trying to tell. But you very well might 
uh, identify with the story that Mary Cassatt is telling or Artemisia Gentileschi, uh, Artemisia Gentileschi is telling or the story that, that, uh, uh, any one of a million women artists have created, uh, throughout history and time and, and other cultures and societies and on and on and on. But anyway, that's a long stove box of a story. That was, and I don't even know where you're going with that story. Like, what's what's the whole... It's just like, just how, how important the work that, that George Sout did. Well, I think it's... Okay, so here's my thought, though. Like, why... I mean, to me, preserving art seems like such a minimal worry compared to everything else that was going on in that. Why? Why... I mean, preserving lives and reducing war and yeah. saving people. Like, why? That, to me, seems something I would not worry about during, yeah. when there's a war going I, on. I think that the, the, big, the big message in that is our, the art of our society tells the story of our past. And you look at any society that has fallen. What is the first thing they do? They destroy the artwork. Okay, so let me give you an example. When, and this wasn't that long ago, uh, when the United States and our allies were began to fight in um, Iraq after post 9-11. Mm-hmm. And there was all the fighting on the ground and eventually we liberated uh, Baghdad. The city of Baghdad was liberated. Saddam Hussein was then captured. And not terribly long after that, but Saddam Hussein was captured and that sort of thing. Well, when Baghdad was liberated and Saddam Hussein was on the run, what's the first thing that the people did when they were free? The first thing they did was they started tearing down the statues of Saddam Hussein. They started hooking up tow ropes around the neck and the big pickup trucks and trying to pull them down and hitting the the face of the uh, of the statue with their shoes and kicking them and smashing it and destroying it and they were going up to the billboards and the and the the propaganda that was on the walls and they were tearing it down well, ripping of course, it down because they don't want to remit they don't they don't want that to stand. Because the anymore. artwork has a power. Mm-hmm. The same thing is true, which is why you don't find a lot of statues of of Augustus from the Roman Empire. You don't see a lot of statues of, of leaders and, and things like that over time because the next leadership, the next group, the next thing, destroy that propaganda, destroy that stuff, and start again, or erase the memory of that. Right. Because that art has a power. Um, art has the power to make us do certain things. So there's a very famous anti-war painting called Guernica. I did a whole, uh, whole video on Guernica by Pablo Picasso. A huge anti-war mural uh, about World War II. And... Um, at the big, actually, it's right before World War II exploded. But at any rate, there is a copy of Guernica at the UN building in New York City. And right before General Colin Powell goes in front of the world and says, We are going to declare war. What does the UN do before that press conference? They take a great big blue tarp with the UN logo on it and they put it in front of that painting, that anti-war painting that is at the front of the UN. Because the, the painting is to make people remember war is the worst case scenario. Mm-hmm. War is horrible. Innocent people are going to sacrifice for this. And that was what painting that that's what that painting evokes in people. And they covered it up because they knew this would be kind of the a cross message. They're talking about declaring war in front of an anti war painting. Right. Art has the power to do that. Art has the power to teach 
you about where we're at, what our life is, what our society is, what we believe, what what are our laws, how do we live? Now what we, we have social media for that. Well, we we do, but what happens when all s- social media collapses? <laughs> it becomes obsolete. Yeah. You know, remember all those really important posts that you put on MySpace a hundred years ago? Where are they at now? How much influence do they have? Zero. How much influence might this video right here have in a month? Probably maybe zero, maybe some, but maybe zero. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree with you. I'm just saying now there are other there ways are. that there are other ways. There are other documenting ways. Documenting time but, and but places I, and people and but but in that time period, that was it. That was well, I think that self expression. Self-expression is always going to be an important art form. Now, the art might evolve. You know, it might go from painting and drawing to digital media to videos and other things. There's other f- art forms, um, as we've talked about before. You know, I, I view uh, some of the video content that I'm producing as an art form. Right. This is more of a discussion of that art form where, um, you know... Is that art that's going to be consumed in in a different space than a gallery space? Absolutely. But just because it's not in a gallery doesn't mean it's not art. It doesn't mean it's not important. Um, you know. Yes, I agree. And I think that it's important for uh, the preservation of everybody's message. Um, it makes sense. I just, during that specific time frame, it just surprises me that right. that was such a push but right. i mean i get it and well and not to mention to the fact degree. that that adolf hitler wanted to he wanted to eradicate modern art he wanted to get rid of the abstract paintings he wanted to get rid of henry matisse he thought that his art was was wrong and uh against the code of humanity and if uh uh, I mean, he basically declared war on on modern art, right. and he wanted it to be out of his country, and uh, because that wasn't good. It, what, he wanted postcards, and he wanted realistic looking things, and he wanted right. he wanted these things uh, to be very very uniform. And if it wasn't realistic, it was wrong. Has there ever been something similar to that, like? recently to what they did during the or what stout did then i mean do we make that a precedence now there are there are um i was just reading an article not very long ago i believe it was in smithsonian magazine i might be wrong on the publisher but i'm pretty sure it was smithsonian magazine and it had a whole article on um there's a huge issue in Afghanistan, or there has been a huge issue in Afghanistan, where um, people were stealing artworks and things like that out of their museums. They were stealing cultural objects and uh, the gold and the this and the that and the hist- and again the history of the, uh, out of their museums and basically, you know, trying to to uh, make a profit off of war and stealing and stealing from a country stealing from a culture stealing from a society and there is a group of soldiers military personnel whose job it is to try to figure out where these things went so that they can go back to the rightful spot and um and so these kinds of things are still happening in our world today uh where there are um historical objects and things like that 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 are trying to or they're trying to get them back to the rightful spot um more and more there is a push on uh museums and things like that to all right let's give egypt back all of those egyptian artifacts instead of them just sitting in an art museum in the mid throughout the midwest or wherever let's like okay is there something we can do to get these objects back to Egypt and, um, you know, 
an exchange or whatever so that they can, you know, they can have their, the, the objects that are attributed to their culture Preserve. back. Right. Preserve their culture. Right. And their history. Right. Makes sense. As opposed to yeah. that being in, in London or New York or whatever city you, you fill in the blank, you know, it should be in, in somewhere in their own country of origin. And, uh, and there's a, and there's again, a lot of push and that's not the only one. There are other examples of that, um, of, uh, trying to get artwork back to its native thing. There, it, as a matter of fact, a couple of years ago, there was a big push by Iowans to try to get Grant Woods American Gothic to the Des Moines Arts. It was in the Des Moines Arts Center, I believe, for a very short period of time. But there was a push to get that back to Iowa. It's an Iowa painting. It's Grant Wood. He's an Iowa guy. That deserves to be in. But, you know, the Chicago Art Institute is not going to give that up. I mean, they've, they're have they the original owners of it. Uh, they bought it directly from Grant Wood. So... Yeah. It's kind of hard to, you know, but anyway. Just a You're right. All right. Well, that was a long, oh. a long stint into the journey into the archives. Well, you got to do what you got to do. That was interesting. I did not. I mean, I, I do think it, I never looked at it from that perspective of they were preserving their history. Um, I don't know. It, it, well, to well, me, it seemed unimportant to address during a war. But when you put it the way you do, I, I do understand. All right. Well, thanks for watching. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Art One-on-One. -on -One. Please like, subscribe, um, share with other people, and help us to grow. Thank you very much. You have yourself a blessed day. <laughs>